Hello and welcome back to The Art of Parenting. This is your host, Jeanne-Marie Pinel. And today I have Ellie Harwood, who is also known as the attachment nerd. And I have been following her for a long time. So I am very, very excited to be talking about her work and your new book that are coming out uh, soon, which is very exciting. So Ellie, thank you so much for making the time to be here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to dig in with you. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. So as I always like to get started, I love to have my guests define what the art of parenting means to them. Mm, oh my goodness. How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> as long as you need. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so interesting because a couple of things. So art is a process more than mm -hmm. it is a product. And I think that in the Western world, we kind of confuse that. Sometimes we see something hanging on a wall, a wall and, and the product of the process, we think, well, that's art. Well, I think art is far more about the strokes and the colors that we're choosing and the exploration and the process of what do I want to put here and what, what do I want to push there and how I'm going to move it. So I love describing parenting as an art because it's ongoing there is no final product. You know, you don't launch your children out at 18 and, you know, wipe your hands of them and say, well, I did that and let's hang it on the wall, right? There's this ongoing evolution. And I think because none of our children have ever existed before and our relationships to our children are all unique, you know, there's a complexity to saying to anybody, here's what you do. Here's exactly how you do it. Um, because every single parenting process is its own unique piece of art. Um, mm. So I love that. And I also love the idea of art and parenting because so much of what we do is creative. <laughs> you know, we try to come up with a metaphor to explain something to our children. We try to find a way to pass the time when they're dysregulated. You know, there's this creativeness to the process of raising children. Um, so what does the art of parenting mean to me personally? I think for me personally, my art has been learning to create security and learning to gather as many tools and mm, I'm trying to use this metaphor well, like when an artist is deciding to make something, right? They're they're looking at what materials are they going to gather and mm. and and how are they going to put all those materials together? And I think for me, I didn't inherit a ton of materials. I had to really scavenge for those materials. Um, but it's been sort of this life-giving process for me to go out into the world. Where are the secure materials that I can draw upon because I didn't inherit all of them? And how can I piece some of these things together through research, through relationships in my life, through other forms of art, honestly, through books and literature and films and, and kind of find a way to put together that I hope for my children will lead them to having a deep sense of inner security and relational security. I belong in the world. I am worthy of care. I can rely on other people and I can have close, authentic relationships. That's what I want the mm. mosaic to be. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. And, and I love how you started with it is a process, right? There, there is no mm -hmm. final product. I mean, mm -mm. yes, we want to, you know, have well adjusted human beings and all that. But that is that is a process in itself, right? It, it it's ever yes. evolving. And, and so and so is parenting. I love that that what you say about, you know, how you didn't inherit mm -hmm. certain things and that, you know, I've, I've always thought that generational we we're evolving as parents because mm -hmm. we have more mm -hmm. information we have people like you mm -hmm. who do mm -hmm. research and who share it mm -hmm. and so forth so so we evolve um so beautiful thank you for that um so before we get started i'd love for you to just take a moment to introduce yourself and and kind of the work that mm -hmm. you've been doing and 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 kind mm -hmm. of how you came to do the work you're doing yes well i'm I tend to be a little bit of a linear thinker in terms of like how I tell a story. So I'm going to just start at the beginning. So at the beginning is 
I was born into a family that had some really insecure legacies. Um, I like to joke if my family tree was a Christmas tree, that the ornaments on my family tree would be primarily domestic violence, mental illness, childhood sexual abuse, um, estrangement. There's a lot of pain in the family tree that I inherit on. Um, but there was also, you know, resilience, strength. There were little p pieces of hope. There were definitely strong women in my family tree um, who endured a lot of very hard things and worked to try to protect their children as best. Um, so when I came into the world, I very quickly became what we would call parentified, which is that I took on a role of taking care of the emotions in the family as a child. My mom was ruling. She was not okay. Parentified, you said? Yes. So the term, when, a okay. child, you know, when a child takes on the role of being the regulator, as opposed to developing and having grown-ups regulate them. My dad had a serious addiction. My mom had some mental illness. My cat, if you just heard a bell ringing, that's my cat. Um, and so no one was really okay and I was a quick, smart child, and I was able to notice that and then um, adapt towards taking care of others. And so I joke when people say, how long have you been a therapist? I'm like, well, um, over four decades. I mean, maybe, maybe <laughs> it didn't take well. It was like, you know, two, three, four, I'm not sure. But there is this um, trajectory in my life pattern of being born into the insecurity. And so having said, I've studied it in my body, in my family, in my nervous system. And then my mom, when I was nine years old, something really beautiful. She made an incredible choice for herself. She was at a bus where she thought that ending her life might be a good option. And somehow she made unbelievable courageous decision to be the very first fam or person in her family and her lineage to go and reach out for help. She checked herself into a psychiatric hospital and she really, from that point forward, created this legacy of healing in my family. She kept laboring to do what she could to heal and to be honest about our family inheritance. And that allowed me to have less baggage than she had. I stuff, but I had less. And in my process, I was able to go to therapy in my early 20s. And that's where I discovered the attachment research. And as I discovered that research, it was like all the light bulbs went on. I was like, oh my gosh, this is me. This is us. This makes so much sense. I fit into this category with my mom. I fit into this category, a different category with my dad. I can see how this all plays out in my different relationships. Um, and that led me to going to graduate school which then ended up in a practice that was focused on relationships and healing attachment. And about 15 years into my clinical career, I just got an itch to start running my mouth more publicly. I felt Ooh. like it felt very clear to me that we have this data and that the data wasn't very accessible for people. You know, a lot of it was a little bit confusing or talked about in more overgeneralized ways. And I thought, I, I think I really want to start not just doing this healing work in my clinic, but also trying to do gen work out in the, you know, that I can lay on my bed, you know, at 95 or however old I'm going to be. And I can say, you know what? I did what I could to make the world a more secure place. I had the information and I shared the information. And so... That is how I came to call myself the attachment nerd and we're with you now. Yeah, and beautiful. And thank you for that of, of using what, you know, could have been, I mean, was hardships and, and kind mm -hmm. of, you know, your the cards that you were dealt with, but to use them to to benefit others, to, mm -hmm. to you know, heal yourself, mm -hmm. but to help us understand and and heal ourselves so thank you for that um and and like i told you offline i've been following you for for quite some time and i just love your your very clear and and kind of um how do you say 
not simple, but but we understand we understand the message, right? It's yeah. not scientific. It's not research. It's yeah. just like, oh yeah, oh I get it, yeah. Which yeah, is I tried to just bring it. Thank you. <laughs> no, you're so welcome. I mean that, yeah. and part of it is yeah. I'm honestly I'm doing it for myself. I'm in the throes of motherhood. I have twin four and a half year olds and a nine year old, and even though I have had a relationship with this research for a very long time, it's very different when you're on the ground and you're in the daily and it's bedtime or, you know, I'm just thinking like I had kind of a rough situation with a friend this week and it really affected my nervous system. And, you know, that process of how do I, re how do I regulate me? And yet my kids are still, well, we're at the end of summer. So they're a little more feral than normal, right? We're at that point where we <laughs> really need school to start. And so, you know, the, the on the ground application of this is far more complex emotionally than I think when we kind of talk about it, it's like, Oh, blah, 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 blah. So I try to, I try to take those two things and marry them. How do I take this, mm -hmm. this information that can guide us and, and make it so that we can actually apply it in the absolute chaos of on the ground parenting. Right. And so right. simplifying in hopes that it, it can connect with people and they can go, Oh, there's something I can do. Here's what I'm going to do. Right. Right. Well, thank you for that. And so going back to, to your, your work, first of all, I mean, if you wouldn't mind maybe doing a attachment 101 kind of, <clears throat> you know, what, why is it so important and how do we, um, because I mean, I have, you know, I have my, my understanding of it, of, of, mm -hmm. you know, through my, the, the, my Montessori background and so forth about, mm -hmm. you know, how we need to really help a child have security, um, that the world is safe, right? That, that, that I trust mm -hmm. the world and then, and then it's tr to trust ourselves. And those to me are the mm -hmm. two kind of security that that we have and the two kind of legs that we we stand on yes. but that's my simplified well, understanding no, and beautiful. i would love beautiful. The, okay okay and i would love if it's you beautiful. could just like kind of give us a attachment 101 yeah well the the theory of attachment really got um popularized or verbalized um in the research community in the 1950s and uh, 1960s and what um, those researchers were kind of noticing is, huh, there's something about the way that the parent-child relationship affects development process. And I think also true for teachers. And that's what Maria Montessori really did is she went, huh, there's something about the way we teach. So the way that I, as a teacher, enter the classroom and set up the classroom, it affects the trajectory of the child's learning and development process. And so the the attachment researchers were noticing a couple of things. So one, they noticed that human beings are inherently relationally wired. There is no baby in the history of humanity who has crawled out of the uterus, looked at us and thought, man, I can do better. I don't need them. I got this. I'm just going to go, right? We're, we are born and in a developmental system. So we're not individually capable without caregivers for a very long period of time. And in comparison to other mammals, quite ridiculously so, right? You know, you watch an elephant get born if you've ever gotten lost on like a YouTube animal channel and then giraffe get born. And it's like they come out of that amniotic sac and they walk, right? It takes yeah. the human child generally, I mean, early walking is nine months, but most children walk around 12 months. So that is a long time. And the, the idea that we think, we think this is because it has allowed us to develop such complex and large brains. So in order to get a baby out of now, born earlier in our developmental process, and then we get to like stew and development in relationship to our caregivers. Um, and when we look at the data around the nature of the relationship, we recognize that not all parents are the same. So even babies all come out with the same needs. They have dependency needs, they have needs for food, they have needs for regulation and closeness and temperature control, all those things. Not every parent 
has the same skill level in offering an infant care. And that is true across every developmental stage. You know, not every parent has the skills to handle a toddler tantrum or a elementary school student or a hormonal teenager, right? So the, the reason is what the parent does has a tremendous outcome in terms of how the child feels about them, feels about the world, feels about emotions and relationships and needs. And therefore, this is the part where it gets really even the physical structure of their brain. The parent-child relationship is affecting the physical structure of a child's brain in the long term. Wild is that? It is. It is very wild. And I know I've seen I've seen images of brains of you know children who have secure attachment and unfortunately children who have been abandoned or, mm -hmm. you know, don't. And, mm -hmm. and it's true that the, the size of the brain is, is smaller. It's, it's just, yeah, it's terrible. The, the size of the prefrontal cortex is smaller in insecure dynamics because the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that helps us learn. It's not the part of the brain that helps us survive. So now the whole brain helps us survive. And we could talk about that in more complex ways. But in general, the part deal with threat is our amygdala. And so that part of the brain in children with trauma is often double the size in adulthood as secure peers. Wow. So secure, deep secure experiences in childhood tend to in adulthood have thinking brains or reaction brains. Whereas children who have trauma have that inverse, thinner thinking brains, larger reaction brains because they didn't have access to an external person who was regulated enough to help them feel safe and therefore to focus on learning. The human brain will always focus on survival over learning. So we must feel safe in order to acquire information. Fascinating. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. or, to, or to optimally, I should say that differently because there are some people that are very, very unsafe in their home environments and they children found refuge in academia in school so they could learn in school, but they still weren't optimally learning. I'd be curious what would have happened in their lives. So felt safe, you know, so you can still learn to some degree based on your, you know, genetic predispositions around some of those things. But, um, likely I could still end by the threat sense of threat in the environment mm -hmm. relation. Really. So, so for those parents who are listening and who might be wondering, like, am I, am I creating, you mm -hmm. know, a secure attachment? Am I doing it right? And so forth. Like, what would be the, the how to's of making mm -hmm. sure that we are creating that secure bond f with our child from, you know, from the get go. And I know for myself, you know, I'm a older parent, my children are, are young adults. So you know, uh, less than 30 years ago, we were still telling mothers to let their babies cry because we yes. were going to spoil them. Yes. I'm, I'm of that generation. And, and it irks me to think that I believe that at I some know. point. Um, but you know, Thank it you is for saying like, that. It, it's, because it was, it's hurt, you know, it hurts. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But, but I want to honor something, all of us, all of us are going to have places we look back and go, oh, <laughs> I'd like to yeah. have done that differently. Because, you know, we talked again about parenting as an art and a process. And part of the process is we learn as we go. And we only mm. have the information at hand, right? Um, I write in my book that in the 1800s, you know, the behaviorist, uh, Dr. Watson wrote in his book, Behaviorism, don't hug and kiss your children. If you must give them a kiss on the forehead before bed and, and then shake their hands in the morning, <laughs> which is the image of children in the morning just really kills me. Um, oh. But, you know, he, he didn't have information. He had information from the set of science that he was utilizing, which wasn't actually with humans, but um, the, the key, I think, in, in, as we have this conversation is I want everyone who's listening to remember 
You are someone who listens to parenting podcasts. You have been doing the best you could with what you have. And there will be places we recognize, oh, that wasn't it. And there's almost, almost always an opportunity to reconcile that. So like, I think there's power in you going to your children as adults and not in a deeply anxious way or a guilty way, not about them taking care of you and reassuring you, but in a, hey, I just want you to know that if I had a redo over, I would have given the middle finger to all of those usually <laughs> men telling me to leave you crying. And I would, I would have picked you up and held you for, I, I would have let myself hold you in the ways my body wanted to. I mean, sometimes I don't want to, I was tired, but most of the time I did. Right. And, and if you have a feeling inside of you that is like, I'm not supposed to have needs, I'm not supposed to cry. That might be a result of some things I didn't give you. And I just want to acknowledge that with you. You know, mm. that's powerful. Right? It is. It is. And it, it's interesting you say that too, because I, I know I, entered parenthood or, or my first pregnancy, I remember telling myself, like, you know, do the best you can. And mm. no matter what you do, your my children will tell me I did it. I didn't do it properly. Or, uh -huh. you know, there was yes. something. So I think that's part of that process. Like you say, yes. right, we, yes. we we do the best with the knowledge, what our elders are telling us and, and yes. so forth. And, yes. you know, and I think there's no coincidence either to why I do the work that I do today. Right. So right. That yes. I, I want to get the, the, the correct information out there, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's always room for growth. So, uh, yes. <clears throat> but, but to, back to, back to you and how to kind of, you know, for those parents listening, the, the young parents who, who thank you are listening to parenting podcasts. So, so that is, you know, you're, you're in, you're going in the right direction, but how would you say is quote unquote, the proper way to create mm. the secure bonds with our children? Yes. So if we are doing these things, I'm going to give you four tips, four very powerful tips, things you can actively do. And if we do these things with regularity, and regularity does not mean perfection, then we are likely going to cultivate a sense of trust with our children. And that is the key to a secure dynamic, is they trust us to be there for them. They trust us to be able to soothe and support them when they are dysregulated. In the research, we call it in a state of tender need. Um, the first is to be present in such a way that our children can see us light up in response to connection mm. with them. Right. And I, I like to use the mm. metaphor of the dog greeting us at the door. Um, you know, obviously we don't need to slobber on our children for them to feel that we want them in the room, but, but that there is this energy that says you bring joy to my nervous system. Being near you is a gift. I want you mm. close. And we can start that in day one. You know, I mean, that's like you pick up your baby and, oh, hey, and, oh, and, you, and you study them and you give them your face. You know, you regard your child. And now you're making me want to use that I know of your French background, but you right to regard is to see. And, and I think when we bring our presence to our children in a way that connotes delight, there's like this medicine that gets wired between us. You know, we want to be around people that delight in us. There's a, there's a mm. reward mechanism there. And that's part of how we hopefully choose our belonging. So we light up. The second thing we do is we show up. We show up for their tenderness. So they are little and they're crying or they're medium and they're disappointed about something or they're anxious about something they're doing. We show up, we, we do our best to be there for them um, in ways that are both grounded and soft. So I like to think of soft and sturdy. That's a help that helps me in a moment. Uh, my kid right now needs to be soft and sturdy. So I'm going to care about and I'm not going to f fall prey to your feelings and take them on myself. I'm I am still sturdy while you are in your throes of your feelings. Um, mm. And then they also need us to show up for their triumphant moments. 
You know, those moments where they found the caterpillar that they've been looking for, or they finally passed that class that they hated with, you know, Mrs. Preston, who was never going to let them get through, but they got to see and they're so proud of themselves or, you know, we, we show up for the tenderness and the triumph because, because those moments are, are attachment moments. When something, this is such a funny story, but this last summer, there was a belly flop contest at my pool. And okay. I won. I won the Ooh. belly flop contest. And I don't know why, but I really just felt so I, Oh, I do know why. I felt proud of myself because almost never do women enter the contest. It's almost always these big beefy dudes. And so I was sort of like, a woman can win the belly flop contest. I've got, you know, I went all, you know, all hands up and sprawled like with all of my heart. And there was like just inherent desire to share that with the people that are closest to me. I, my husband was there and he was amazing about it. So I got his witness and my kids were so cute. I mean, they, they literally cheered me on as if I had like won, some, won an Olympic game. Um, but then I, I called one of my best friends because she wasn't able to be there. And I was like, guess what happened? Right. And her response, it's like, it solidifies that bond. Right. There are a lot of people in my life I would not have called to say I won a belly flop contest because it wouldn't have made sense. They're not my attachment. Figure. And if I had called someone close to me and said I won the belly flop contest and I was full of joy and they were like, why would you do that? Oh, there would be an in there would be a missed opportunity there. So we're showing up for tenderness and we're showing up for triumph. The third thing we want to do is we want to listen up. So we want to create an experience for our children where they sense that we are a safe place to open up, right? We want them to talk to us and tell us things because there are so many complex things that human children face in the world. And we want them to sense that we have a capacity, not just for directing and guiding them, you know, which is kind of instinctive as a parent. Don't judge that. Don't do that. You can't do this. But that we also have this deep capacity to really hear what they have to say on all levels. So we're doing what we can to listen up, to create the trust that you can open up to. The last thing that we do is we make up when we mess up. We can yeah. mess up. That is a part of the grid. And when we model for our children that messing up and conflict are a part of relationship and that we can repair without shame or self-contempt, we don't have to create like a, a blame. You know, we can just come back around and go, I'm so sorry I was so harsh or distracted or I really messed up. I, I got the date wrong and I thought it was this and I, I'm so sorry. And it's not, I'm so sorry. Do you forgive me? Because that's more like, can you help me feel better about my mistake? It's more, I acknowledge that something I did or didn't do affected you and it's not what I want. And let's come back together. It's returning to connection. I think of it as like getting back on the tracks. So we all get off the tracks the tracks, and then our kids learn. My parent knows they make mistakes, and so, they, you know, through these things, they can sense my parent wants me. My parent is capable of showing up for me. I bring my voice and my needs to my parent, and my parent can hear me. And my parent is capable of getting feedback about what it is that isn't working in our relationship. And those things are like just solid glue between us and our children mm. that keep us close. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes a lot of maturity to be able to do all of that. <laughs> yes, it you does. know, when listening, yes. you go through that. It's like, wow. Yeah. Like we really do have to be the adult in the room and, and, mm. and, you know, kind of step up our game because it's true when you say, you know, I know for me that, that, that apologizing to a child is so, so important, but I know a lot of adults are like, no, I'm not, yeah. you know, it's like, no. And, and it's like, that takes a lot of maturity and, and kind of that, yes. like you, you know, that self-regulation in ourselves to be able to first be aware and to, to, to be aware and to, to, to be truthful with ourselves. Like, oh my gosh, I messed up yes. and, yes. and, and I'm apologizing to apologize, not like you say to, for you to make me feel good. Like, you yes, know, are to you release okay? You still love guilt. me? You still love me? No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so important. It's to, Thank you it's for to that. See um, your pain. You're so welcome. Yeah. I and I love the, the, 
Oh, sorry. We have a ton. Uh, you talk. I won't talk. No, no. I was going to say, I love your, your, your soft and sturdy words mm -hmm. because it, it brings up a very, very much what it is to be a parent, right? We have mm -hmm. to be soft for that, for that tenderness to receive whatever the emotions, but at the same time, be sturdy in, you know, what our values mm -hmm. are, what our boundaries are, what, you know, what yes. our children do need boundaries. They do need mm -hmm. to, you know, and yes. so we have to stay sturdy. And, and I love that. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes. I'm sorry. No, I love what you're saying. The, what I was thinking about is maturity is a relational process. And so when we struggle to be mature in adulthood, it's usually because we didn't have relational experiences that allowed for us to mature. Instead of maturing, parts of us got frozen in time. We survived. So we, mm -hmm. we took the skill sets we had at six or 12 and we just worked with them. Right. And we kept using them. Uh, but we hadn't had an experience where someone could really contain us and reflect back to us and nuance our feelings for us. And so we come into parenthood and we tend to really stall out at the age that that in regards to handle our children and the age that we didn't receive the care we needed. Um, mm. So there is a lot of work that can be done, but is hard to do in the midst of parenting. I just want to honor that. You know, I have a, I got very lucky in that I did a lot of my work before I became a parent. And I have to tell you, it's still hard to stay mature in those big emotional moments. Mm -hmm. But if you recognize, wow, I don't know how to help my child because no one helped me, then you can start to do the work of looking back. And that's powerful work to say, what did my caregiver do or not do? when I was having a tantrum or in the throes of dysregulation or, you know, pushing a boundary, what was that message? Who was there? You know, you can go through those four things I just talked about. Did, did my parents or my people light up for me? Did they show up for me? Did they listen up to me? And did they make up with me? And if your answer is no, 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 no. Well, okay. We're going to have a lot of work to do, but I, it's possible and you can do it. That's actually my first book I wrote is a guided journal is for that exact reason. As I was writing, you know, around the topic of parenting was like, there has to be a process for the people who are like, I have to heal a little bit before I can be the parent. Because if you've come into parenting and no one's ever taken care of you, it is hard to take care mm. of the needs of underdeveloped human beings 24 seven. Right. Right. And they can, and they, and they will, they will kind of trigger what probably didn't mm -hmm. happen or what you missed out on and, and yes. so forth. So, so, so on that topic, how, how does one repair, right? Because you say that it would be mm -hmm. ideal if we did this work, you know, before we, for me, I mean, I would say that we even think of having children, that we, you know, really <laughs> do this work. But oftentimes, I feel like we don't realize that there has mm -hmm. been that trauma until we have children, right? Because they awaken yes. certain aspects of us. So, yes. so how do or we in, repair that? Age. Yes, or they, until they hit a certain age, and it triggers a part of ourselves we didn't realize was still unhealed or unwell or unmature, immature, unmature. <laughs> Um, so what do we do? Well, I would say the first thing we have to do is we have to seek out people who can help care for us. So if we recognize that we have messed up a piece of this dynamic and we have not here in one of those ways, we have to find caregivers for our heart. Because if we just try to make it better, make it better, we're going to do that in a very anxious way. So we need people who can come around and offer us what it actually feels like when someone is bearing witness to your pain and to your shame and offering you containment and support, which what that symbol then looks like is like, tell me, sounds awful. I'm so sorry you went through that. That makes sense that you thought this. I'm also noticing that, you know, someone who really engages you. Therapy is the probably ideal setting for that just because you can hand someone some money and their entire job is to be there for you. Whereas in other relationships, you have to 
do more of that flexity, which can be hard when you're trying to heal a childhood wound because you're like, I want to be the child. And the other person's like, no, I want to be the child. <laughs> In therapy, it's like, well, no, you are the child. The therapist is not the child. We're going to deal with this. Um, but that could be a mentor or community group or a partner or a really good friend. I mean, some of us are rich with resources. Some of us are not. I think it depends on who you have in your world. But you're going to need to learn what does it feel like when someone is responding securely with you so that you can really get that embodied sense of it rather than just trying to say mm. the right thing or do the right thing. Like knowing what that actually feels like that presence from somebody so get support. Um, I have uh, started a secure parent program. That's one option for people. Um, and as always, I have scholarships available if, if it's something that people can't afford. Um, so that would be one space to like get connected and have support, learn to like process through like what happened in your life and how did that affect your patterns? Um, but I would say once you've done that, and you've really, and you've really offered yourself a sense of compassion about what you didn't get or what you did get that you wish you hadn't gotten, then you can step back and really reflect on how do you think your actions or inactions impacted each of your children? Because they're all different. You know, you're going to have, you're going to have a child, if you have more than one child who I mean, I'm thinking about my twins right now. One of my daughters is like, please just kiss me as much as possible. And if possible, could I return to your uterus and just sit in there for half of the day? <laughs> like that's how she feels loved. And my other child really, truly, she does not like kisses. She does not like to be contained, but a good solid massage or back scratch or rough play, you know, those things what make her feel deeply loved. And so we want to pay attention to each of our kids and really think what having me about how I impact them? What do I notice in their body language and their behavior and, you know, the stories they've told me about themselves, how they see themselves. Um, and, you know, depending on the age, if you have a five-year-old, it's hard to sit down and go, mommy had a really awful child. So I was mean to, and here, here are the things that happened to mommy, right? Like, no, 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 no. You no, just, no you work to do better, you know, work to say, sorry, mama lost her patience. Mama lost her cool. I need it. Or I need, I mean, I'm a big fan. My kids regularly hear me say, I can't find my calm. So I'm going to go in the other room and see if I can find it there. And then I'm going to come back once I know I have found my calm. Right. And mm. so, you know, modeling those things and, and switching the pattern. And I'm telling you when kids are young, this adapts pretty fast. Like if you can really work on shifting how you're interacting, um, there is usually a long period of time because kids are like, thank goodness I've wanted this from you. Right. It's harder if you have a grown up kids because they may have developed coping skills at such a level that they actually don't want to be open either. They're like, why, why, why just leave it in the past, mom, whatever we want to right. move on. And, even if you see the negative ramifications in their life and their patterns, you know, you might have to take a little slower in terms of your expectations of their response to your change. But with older kids, you also can be more direct. You know, if you have a 12 year old and you can say, so I'm starting to learn that I actually really messed some things up here. <laughs> I didn't know. I thought I was doing the right things, but it turns out I wasn't. So I'm going to work on it. You're going to feel awkward. I'm going to feel awkward. But I think it's a better choice. So that's what's happening for now. And, you know, you can give me feedback. You know, and they may look at you like, yeah, right. You, I can't give you feedback. I'm not even allowed to talk back, you know, or something. And, and, they, and you have to earn that trust. They have to, they have to see you shift. You understand your responsibility in relationship to them. Um, but yeah, I would say it really starts with getting care and offering yourself compassion and then attuning to what, what changes can I be making and what does need to be acknowledged? Sometimes there are things that need to be acknowledged. Uh, it's like, just make the changes. Right. Right. And to me, it just, it just sounds like it's a lot of, of awareness of just being yes. honest with ourselves of what we might be feeling, what might be kind of, 
triggering and being, you know, in tune to, like you were saying earlier, what our, our body is feeling, right? I know the the, you know, when I work with families, I always remind parents to ask their children, like, where do they feel things in their bodies? And I think it's so mm-hmm. important for us to do that for ourselves. So, uh, Absolutely. so thank you for that. That's, yeah, so, so important. Thank you. <clears throat> well, as we, I mean, I could go on for for many, <laughs> many hours, but I'm going to start kind of uh, wrapping up. And I always like to kind of circle back to a more personal mm-hmm. uh, kind of, you know, uh, how do you say, reminisce. And you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier that you have a nine-year-old and then your four-and-a-half-year-old twin. So mm-hmm. if you were to go back 10 years mm-hmm. when you were expecting your first child, <clears throat> what wise words would you tell yourself knowing all that you know today? Mm. I'm going to start with something funny. Okay. One thing I would tell myself is you really aren't going to sleep like you used to ever again. <laughs> <laughs> because I think I had, I had a bit of a, of a myth, I think partially from a lot of the cry it out kind of culture of, of like, Oh, I'm going to do this thing and then my kids will sleep. And then there's just just a short period of time. And I don't know, I had a kid with a, you know, had to get her tonsils and adenoids out because she had a breathing problem. She didn't sleep till she was four and a half. And I have three children. So many, many times someone isn't sleeping because they're having a nightmare or a gross spurt or a cold cat woke them up. I mean, for heaven's sake, you just don't sleep all that much. So I think, and then I think the not so funny, you know, connection to that part is, you're going to be doing an incredible thing and your capacity for everything else has to reduce. You are not going to be as good of a friend as you used to be. You are not going to be able to, you know, it's like, if you're going to paint the Sistine Chapel, you aren't mass producing art for the market, right? It's like, this is going to consume your world. And so please do not expect yourself to continue to function in all other ways that you had previously. Because I think that has been a hard part of art process for me is going, I mean, I love being on top of things. I love having next and having a plan and answering emails properly and not messing up appointments. And man, that's changed. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I mean, I've I've left my phone in the refrigerator for heaven's sake. Like things just are <laughs> not, you know, in order. Like it's not going to be orderly, um, in the way that you previously illusioned yourself that life could be. It's going to be orderly right. and enjoy right. enjoy it as much as you can. And also, it's okay that some parts of it are just really hard. Right. Right. And and that's, I mean, such wise words that I wish all parents can hear, especially especially those um, expecting, because it's mm-hmm. true. I think we're, we're told, you know, oh, we'll just bounce back and, you know, yeah. get your, you know. You can have it physical. all. Well, no. yes. <laughs> There's, no. you, you, you learn to prioritize and you, you just, you know, it's, yeah. But beautiful. Thank you for that, Ellie. And any any parting words that you would like to leave our listeners with today, listeners and viewers? Do the best you can and apologize when it's necessary, right? Like do the best you can with what you have now. And then when you learn about how you messed up, own up. Just say, I'm so sorry, kid. Oh my gosh. Yes. I wish I, you didn't feel like I was there. Even if in your head, you're like, are you kidding me? I was there every single time I missed one practice, right? But you just say, I'm so, I, you needed that. Clearly you need, you feel like you needed that for me. And I'm really sorry that I wasn't able to be. So, you know, don't live in fear of messing it up. Do the best you can. And then trust that when the mess up is acknowledged, there is power in just saying, I'm so sorry. I wish I, I, if I could go back and redo it based on what you're telling me, I would. Thank you. Thank you for that. Beautiful. And thank you so much for spending this moment with us today and sharing all of your wisdom. Just absolutely love being here. And I'm thank you for supporting my work and this book coming out, which feel it's funny. I, 
I do feel a little bit, little bit like I'm in the fourth trimester. You know, it's about to come out. I'm heavy with the book. I'm ready for it to go. I've been preparing and planning and thinking about it and waiting for it. And I'm like birthing it out into the world. So it's going to be interesting to kind of see what happens after it's been birthed. Yes. And that is Raising Securely Attached Kids. So get yes. your copy uh, and that. Uh, thank you for that. Absolutely. Alrighty, thank you. Thank you.